right. Uh, we learned that the potential energy from gra gravity is MGH, uh, but this is only true close to the surface of the Earth. Um, we can't use this when we start moving off into space. Uh, when we did spring force, we looked at kind of an average value. Uh, we know that work is equal to force times distance. There's a cosine theta in there, but if we say the force is in the same direction, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, really, work is actually more like an integral of force with respect to distance. Uh, so the work done by a gravitational force would be the integral of g m1 m2 over r squared with respect to dr. Uh, <clears throat> and if we take that integral, we get minus g m1 m2 over r squared, um, plus a constant. But all that ever matters physically is a change in potential energy. So we don't really I'm oh, sorry, not squared, just r. <laughs> but all that matters is a change in potential energy, and so we don't really uh, care about that. So we define our our gravitational uh, potential energy, and remember we defined the work done by gravity and potential energy for gravity in the opposite direction. The work done by gravity was minus mg delta h. Uh, so Gravitational potential energy then is G M1 M2 over R. Uh, so notice that as R goes to infinity, this potential energy goes to zero. And we define potential energy as being zero uh, at infinity. And then, I'm sorry, we're supposed to take this integral. When we integrate the work, we're going we integrate from R to infinity. And at infinity, R is zero, of course. So we have minus G M1 M2 over infinity, which is zero. And then we have <coughs> plus G M1 M2 over R. So our gravitational potential energy is minus G M1 M2 over R. As radius goes to infinity, potential energy goes to zero. As radius goes to zero, our potential energy goes to minus infinity. Uh, so potential energy, as we move further from the Earth, potential energy is getting closer to zero, but it's negative. So as we move further from the Earth, potential energy is increasing. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. uh, so potential energy is, is always a, a scalar. Uh, and so it, it does decrease as we get closer to the surface of the Earth, but it's decreasing by becoming a larger uh, negative number. Okay. Um, just like we did with uh, with, gravi with uh, gravitational force, we can find potential energy of a system of objects. Uh, so let's say we have one object at 0, 5.5 centimeters. We have another object at the origin. And we have a third object at 3 centimeters. Um, at zero, and we give their masses. Um, let's say this is 1.8 kilograms. This is M2 is this is 1.1 kilograms, and this one is 2.8 kilograms. And I want to find the potential energy of this arrangement. Well, remember, PE is a scalar. So the potential energy of this arrangement is just the sum of all the potential energies uh, of these two. So the potential energy of the system is just the potential energy of these two plus the potential energy of these two plus the potential energy of these two. So everything has a, a minus g attached to it. And then we just do each pair of masses, 1.1 times 2.8 over 5.5 centimeters, 0.055 plus 1.1 times 1.8 over the distance between these two would be the square root of 0.055 squared plus 0.03 squared plus when the potential energy of this pair is 2.8 times 1.8 over 0.03 squared. And that would be how we figure out the potential energy of this little arrangement of 
of particles. Uh, you can just add up all the, the potential energies. Um, now remember, if only gravity is acting, we know our non-conservative the work done by non-conservative forces is delta Ke plus delta Pe. Uh, and if work non-conservative is zero, then that means that our delta Ke, one half m d final squared minus d naught squared, plus delta Pe, which is what? Uh, minus g m1 m2 over r2 plus g m1, m2 over r1 is equal to zero. And so we can use that conservation of energy to uh, to solve problems. Let's say, for example, an asteroid has zero velocity at infinity, an infinitely uh, large, really large distance away from Earth. And then it hits Earth. So what speed does it have when it hits Earth? Well, we can solve this by using conservation of energy. At infinity, this is zero, and our V naught is zero. So you can say one half m v final squared equals move this over, g m1 m2 over r2. r2 is just the radius of the Earth. The masses cancel out, so we have the final velocity of the object is g. Second mass is mass of Earth over radius of the Earth times 2 square rooted. And uh, if we uh, plug those values in, we get all those, we get about 11,200 meters per second. Um, now the reason that's it's kind of interesting is that works the same in reverse. If we want it to leave Earth's surface and, and escape Earth's gravity, would have to be going upward with 11,200 meters per second. So essentially, uh, this is known as escape velocity. Uh, if you were just to kind of throw an object upward, hurl an object upward from Earth's surface, this is the velocity it would need to, so that it didn't fall back down to Earth. Uh, now, in reality, when we shoot rockets up there and whatnot, they don't have this speed at the beginning, you know, uh, but they get faster as they go upward by continuing to fire rocket fuel out of them. But if you just wanted to, like, fire a catapult and throw something out of Earth's orbit, that would be the, the velocity uh, it would have to have. Uh, yeah. Let's say Pluto's average distance from the sun is 5.874 times 10 to the 12th meters. At this distance, it has a speed of 4.7 kilometers per second. What is its speed at perihelion, which is 4.437 times 10 to the 12th meters from the sun? Well, we know that mechanical energy is constant. So we can take our potential energy 1 plus kinetic energy 1, and set that equal to potential energy 2 plus kinetic energy 2. Uh, and uh, if I look at the internet, I find that Pluto's mass is 1.309 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms. Uh, the mass of the sun is in your excuse me, in your textbook, uh, and it is 2.00 times 10 to the 30th, 30, not 33, times 10 to the 30th kilograms. And then uh, plugging in the other data, we can figure out what its speed is at perihelion. So we've got minus 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th times the mass of Pluto times the mass of, Earth, of the sun, sorry. <clears throat> Over the distance, 5.874 times 10 to the 12th, plus 1 half 
mass of Pluto times 10 to the 22nd. Uh, velocity 4.7 kilometers per second, which is 4,700 meters per second. And we set that equal to <clears throat> our potential times kinetic at the other point when we're 4.437 times 10 to the 12th meters from the sun. <clears throat> plus one half times mass of Pluto velocity squared. Whew, this is going to be a pain to punch in, but we can work it out. This is a 10 to the 52, 10 to the 41, minus 12 is 10 to the 29th, so 6.67 times 1.309 times 2 times 10 to the 29th uh, over 5.874 negative plus 0 0.5 times 1.3 e22 times 4700 squared <clears throat> and then we add on the other side we have the same 52 minus 23 we also have 29 powers of 10 so we plus 6.67 times 1.309 times 2 e29 divided by 4.437 times 2 divided by the mass square rooted and we get that its velocity at perihelion is 6794.996 meters per second which makes sense because that's more than its velocity at any other time uh, so we can do conservation of energy like that it's kind of annoying when you get into astronomical numbers with all these powers of 10 uh, but but we can work it out. Um, a couple little fun facts here. Black holes are they're collapsed stars um, but the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. Uh, and That's kind of what defines a black hole is that nothing uh, can get back out. Uh, there's a point in a black hole called the event horizon. And once something crosses the event horizon, then nothing can get back out. Um, black holes can't be observed directly, but the, you can, quote, see them because objects emit x-rays as they get close. And also, black holes bend light. So if we're looking from right here, and there's a star back behind you know, this black hole, the light from this star will bend around the, gravity, the black hole, and we'll see you know, and above and below. And so we see multiple images of objects that are directly behind them. That's an effect called gravitational lensing. Uh, and so that's how we have evidence for the existence of black holes. Uh, another phenomenon caused by gravity are tides on Earth. They're caused by the moon's gravity. So if the moon's over here, Earth is here, <coughs> the water <coughs> the water on Earth's surface is closer to the moon than the Earth is, and so it gets pulled a little bit more than the Earth does, and so it kind of bulges outward here. And then on the other side, the Earth is getting pulled more, and so the water is pulled less, so it bulges out here, too. So there are high tides on the sides of the Earth that are closer and furthest from the Moon, and low tides on the sides that are you know, on, the, on the edge. So the Moon causes uh, the tides of the Earth. <clears throat> um, and also, the, there's a bulge in the Moon's surface, and that bulge is always pulled more toward Earth, which is why the same side of the Moon always faces us and it rotates with the same period uh, as the and it rotates with the same period as it revolves <clears throat>